podcasting from sunny Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome to Tips for Tour Operators, your podcast for growth hacks, marketing tips, and actionable insights from leading experts in the tourism industry. Welcome tour operators, owners, friends, marketers, anybody who works in tours and activities. I'm so excited for today's episode. We are talking to Stephen Joyce, the CEO of Resgo. Resgo is one of the most uh, well-known booking softwares on the planet. They have a ton of data that they use that they contribute to big research projects from Focusrite and others. And overall, they're just a really knowledgeable company and Stephen is at the forefront of all of that knowledge. He loves helping and sharing uh, his information with tours. And today we are talking about direct bookings, why you want more of them, why it's important to get them, and what the difference between a direct booking and an indirect booking is, um, especially when you're getting bookings direct to you versus getting through uh, an OTA like TripAdvisor or Get Your Guide. So this is one you won't want to miss, especially if you're concerned about profitability or um, really just where you should be getting your bookings from. Check it out. Let's get started. Steven, thank you for joining us. I'm so excited to have you. You are one of the first people I have ever talked to in the tourism industry personally, one-on-one, -on -one, and um, somebody that I really respect after having that conversation. So thank you very much for joining the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate it. It's always good to, it's always good to get on and, and talk about fun stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, well, I'm really excited about today's topic. You know, we're going to be talking a little bit about how to get more direct sales um, online versus just any other channels. So to get started, you know, just tell me a little bit about your background. Um, well, I've been involved in travel and technology since, uh, oh man, I'm going to, I'm going to date myself here since 1997 was the first travel related website that I worked on. Um, it was a, uh, actually one of the first OTAs in Canada, um, a site called Trippies. So that was that was my first foray into into travel technology into online travels in 1997, and I haven't looked back since. I've worked on a on a variety of different uh, both OTAs as well as uh, smaller uh, tour operator websites since then. Um, and then in 2005, uh, my business partner and I uh, saw an opportunity to uh, to build a piece of software for the for the tour and activity space. And uh, we did some market research and saw that there was uh, clearly a, a gap there for, uh, for online bookings for turn activity. So we we're a little early in the game and, uh, and jumped on it and launched Resgo in uh, 2007. So Resgo has been around now. We just celebrated our, we celebrated our 10th anniversary last year. So we're, wow. we're well into our second decade, which uh, makes it sound old, but uh, it uh, basically just means it's a really solid piece of software now. So, so we're happy with that. Yeah, that's really amazing. Like, I mean, like a round of applause just for hitting that 10 year mark. I know that's difficult for uh, just any business anywhere in the world to hit. So that's really amazing. And I don't think it's old. Like you said, it's mature. I, I think that shows a, a really good mm -hmm. sign of maturity and kind of know what's happening. Yeah. I like, I like that word. I like the word mature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll take that. Well established, mature. We've worked out all the issues. Um, and I, and I think an important thing to mention is that it is that, uh, we built that, uh, we built the company from scratch, uh, and we haven't taken any outside funding. It's been built solely on, wow. um, on, uh, revenue. So, no outside investment, which is which is kind of unusual for for this space, especially especially for uh, software uh, in in the travel space. So, so we're pretty proud about that. Yeah, that's really incredible, and I mean that really shows how good of a platform you guys have and able to to grow to the heights that you've reached. You know, without having any outside funding, that's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. So when we were talking, you had mentioned you basically. I mean, you've been in the travel industry for in the, uh, travel industry for a really long time. Um, you know, having over 10 years. Okay, well, don't say really long time. That just sounds like <laughs> you've been in the travel and you, uh, <laughs> you are a mature individual. Uh, your knowledge, <laughs> your, your knowledge is vast. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but you do, you have a ton of experience in, in hmm. the travel industry and especially, you know, 10 years having Resgo, you've seen a lot of data. You've seen, you know, basically yeah. the ins and outs of how people book tours. Can you share a little bit about, you know, what you've seen um, from your side? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, and, and I, I should note that we, uh, that we have, 
supported research in uh, in the tour and activity space uh, since the very beginning. I mean, we knew coming into this industry that that uh, research was critical. Um, we knew that it, it, if we did research, it was going to probably result in in a in a slew of new competitors and and uh, <laughs> new interest in the space, but. You know, those are the risks that you take. Mm -hmm. um, so we've always funded, we've always helped fund research, and we we helped fund the the initial focus rate research as well as the two additional uh, research projects. So yes, we've had access to a lot of data over the years, starting back in 2011 when the first research project came out, and uh, and it's interesting to see uh, that first one was the U.S. market, second one was kind of Europe and U.S., and then the third one was global. And uh, and what we're what we've seen is that tourism activities is still really an offline, um, an offline space. Hmm. So, um, you know, a lot of the bookings are coming in from direct in-person bookings when customers are in the destination. Um, only about, actually, I, I had said 20% when we were talking earlier. It's actually uh, based on the global research. Globally, it's about 15%. So only about 15%, oh. and that's that's 2016 numbers. They're estimating it's going to go up to about 19 or 20% by by 2020. But still, that's only 20% of revenues uh, for tour and activity businesses coming in through the online channel, which means 80% is still coming in offline. That's direct wow. from the customer to the operator in destination. Um, so it's still very much an offline uh, offline uh, in industry, really. Um, and out of that 20%, the bulk of that 20% is direct online bookings. So those okay. are people finding supplier websites and booking on those supplier websites directly. Um, only, uh, only a small portion of that, about 4%, is coming in through the large OTAs. So, you know, companies like Viator and Expedia and Get Your Guide. So they really are a very small part of the, of the puzzle. Um, they're a very fast growing piece. Um, so that's, you know, that's not something to, to disregard necessarily. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting that, that, uh, because they're big brands, the, the, um, the suppliers tend to kind of focus on them. They, they mm -hmm. kind of, you know, put blinders on and tend to focus on, on the, on the name brand, on Expedia, on Viator, on Get Your Guide. And they think, okay, I've got to sell through them. But realistically, they're really not generating a significant amount of revenue for for uh, tour operators the bulk of their revenues are coming direct to the supplier either through an offline channel or through their online website now what's important to note um, is that as of the the most recent report 65 um, percent of suppliers still don't have online reservation so that Wait, online 65 percent 65%. Yeah. 65% so still don't have more than half of the tours. More than half. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Don't, don't have online reservation. And what's really scary is that in, in the smaller business category of that group, um, 31% of that group said they're not interested in doing online um, <laughs> reservations, wow. that they've got enough bookings through their offline sales that they don't even want to bother with online. Wow. So, um, you know, so it, uh, that kind of gives you a, an indication of of where, the, you know, where the segment is at, where the mindset is right now. So it really is a case of, um, you know, kind of changing that mindset, getting people to think uh, in terms of of online and and in terms of thinking, not just, you know, everybody thinks online means web bookings, but um, for us, online means uh, I mean, ev everything is online, right? When you use mm -hmm. your mobile phone, you're online. When you're using your laptop and you're connecting to Google, that's online. Everything mm -hmm. is online, right? There is no, there's no offline. <laughs> like if you're using, you know, for us, it's about technology. It's about enabling the technology. Um, and it's not just about, I mean, fine. You don't want to sell through a website, fine. You've still got to have tools to manage your availability. I mean, what are you using, pen and paper? Yeah. The answer is yes. A lot of them are still <laughs> using pen and paper. A lot wow. of them are still using, you know, Microsoft Excel or, or you know, if they're a little bit more online, Google Sheets or something to, mm -hmm. to manage their, uh, their seat availability. But it's still very much a, uh, an offline kind of world. So that, that sort of gives you a really good indication of the, of the mindset of where um, operators are at right now. So 
Wow, that's really incredible. Especially like you said, you know, 31% of those, those companies that don't have a website don't want a website. That means they're getting so much offline that is, mm-hmm. it's just, you know, they're sustaining that way. That's really incredible. So, yeah, but, uh, it, you know, at the same time, there, you know, you've got to, that's a very short term. I think a, a lot of it too is, um, you know, looking at the data, a good 60% of the, of the companies that were, that were um, uh, in the research, um, mm-hmm. the, you know, the average number, 60% generate less than $250,000 a year in revenue. Mm-hmm. So these are fairly small businesses and they're usually quite seasonal. So, okay. you know, they're, they're, they're really interested in, in, I mean, if you look at the, at the uh, Canadian market, for example, if you're looking at, at you know, a, a, an operator in, in a market w- which is heavily seasonal, where it's snowing like 12 months. Of the year. <laughs> so you've only got, you know, you've got two months to generate your revenue. They're only open for two months. So they're really just like, you know, heads down, they'll just scramble for two months trying to, trying to generate their business. And then they're kind of done for the year. And they've got to go do other things and they kind of forget about it. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a case where we really need to educate the suppliers to think long term in, in terms of making the business more sustainable. Um, you know, how can you generate revenue in the off season mm-hmm. um, for your business? How can you look at partnerships with other, with other operators in non-competing, uh, non-competing businesses? Um, how can you do, um, you know, potentially merchandise sales or other, or other ways to do brand building that, that can generate uh, revenue for you in the off season and things like that. So I think, you know, we have to look at that education piece. That's mm-hmm. going to take time, but the, I mean, there's just so much opportunity there to, to work with these operators and, and, and kind of bring them up to the next level. Sure. So basically if there's a tour operator out there that doesn't want to grow, they should probably just shut this off and move along because this is all about <laughs> growing, you know, increasing revenue. And so if, if yeah. anybody's listening out there, if you don't want to grow, just shut the podcast off. If you want to grow, keep listening. Yeah. Um, I have a feeling those people that are, that, you know, that 31% that don't have online booking are probably not even watching. <laughs> so I think you're probably safe there. <laughs> good, good. So one thing I want to talk about a little bit is, you know, we talked about online versus offline and, and that's fairly clear. A lot of people mm-hmm. are, um, you know, they might be searching online, but they're not booking online. But let's talk a little bit mm-hmm. deeper about, you know, how they're actually finding the tour. So we talked a little bit about direct versus indirect. Can you explain yeah. what that means a little bit? Just break it down. Yeah, direct bookings are basically the consumer uh, finds and books directly with the supplier. So whether that's through, uh, and if, and if you, if you look at Google research, um, we know that, that over 70% of consumers, when they are, uh, looking for travel, they're, they're they start with search. So they're going to Google and they're doing search. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they're looking for, you know, they're, they're entering, uh, things to do in the destination that they, that they plan on going to. Although we know that, that uh, the majority of the bookings are done closer to the, to the day of travel. And people tend not to book tours and activities like three months in, adva- in advance. They tend to do it closer to, uh, to the day of booking. Uh, within our system, we know it's within uh, seven days. It's kind of the, the, the average. Mm-hmm. And it's actually kind of closer to three days and, and uh, even a lot uh, same day or the day before. Um, but they're on their mobile device in the destination or uh, if they're at home prior to, you know, maybe a couple days before they leave, they, they do a search on Google for things to do and they find a website uh, for a, a tour operator that they're, that they're interested, a tour that they're interested in going on. And they'll do a little bit of research, maybe compare with a, with a few other tours that they want to do, um, you know, look at their schedule and then they'll book direct with, the uh, directly with the supplier and pay with credit card, um, predominantly with credit card. Um, that's how people want to pay, mainly because it gives them some form of protection as well. That that if they pay with their credit card and something goes wrong, they can always do a charge back and things like that. So there's uh, so that there's that level of protection that comes with that. Um, so that's a direct booking. That's uh, an online direct booking. Okay. That's, that's an online direct booking. Now that could also work if the supplier. Um, decides to, to do Google ads, for example, 
mm -hmm. and uh, does a Google ad and it shows up in, in search results and the supplier, uh, sorry, the customer clicks on that ad and goes direct to the supplier's website and does a booking. That can also be considered a direct booking because again, there's no intermediary involved in the sale of that tour. So the, the key difference between an, an indirect and a direct sale is generally that the supplier is the, per, is the merchant of record. So if there is someone else that is the merchant of record in the relationship, and what I mean by merchant of record is the, is the, um, the company that, that takes payment, mm -hmm. right? Processes the payment on behalf of the customer. Um, if that is not the supplier, then it's an indirect booking. So in the case of Expedia or in the case of Viator, when you book through Viator, what shows up on your credit card is Viator. Mm -hmm. What does not show up on your credit card is the name of the supplier. When you book with the supplier, what shows up on your credit card is the supplier's name. So that's generally the way, uh, the way it works, is who gets the money when you book. Um, and in the case okay. of direct bookings, it's the supplier that gets the money. In the case of an indirect booking, it's a third-party agent that gets the booking and then that third party agent is responsible for paying the supplier at some point in the future and taking their commission and doing all that sort of stuff. So that's really the key difference between supplier or sorry, a direct and an, and an indirect booking. For the so most which, part. which from your opinion is the best way to go? I mean, should people try to go after an indirect booking, uh, you know, through the OTAs or should they try to get more direct bookings? Oh, more direct bookings. The direct bookings are by far the, the uh, most valuable. Um, and, and the reason, there's really three reasons why um, the direct bookings are, the, are preferred. Number one, the supplier is getting the money directly from the customer. Number two, the supplier owns the customer. Um, and number three, the supplier has the ability to communicate directly with the, with the customer after the booking experience. So they can do things like get reviews directly from the customer, they can mm. get feedback from the customer, they can, they can market to the customer uh, in the future or, or use word of mouth uh, referral marketing in order to get that customer to help drive more sales um, to their friends or things like that. Um, the, you cannot do any of those three things when it's a direct booking, when it, well, sorry, an indirect booking. When it's an indirect booking through an OTA, the OTA takes the money and mm -hmm. pays the supplier at some point in the future. Now, with the with the big OTAs, that you know that that's decreased uh, the time uh, to to uh, to redemption has has decreased quite a bit. But you still generally have to wait for that for that tour to be redeemed, um, and then there's some time after the redemption of the tour, the, the customer actually showing up for the tour, that you actually get paid by by the um, by the OTA. And meanwhile, they're holding on to your money for generating interest on it and all kinds of other things. So um, number two, the OTA owns the customer. So in the contracts that you have with it, that the suppliers have with OTAs, generally what they say is that you cannot communicate with the customer other than for the pur purposes of, of uh, you know, providing them with a status on the, on the tours or wow. things like that. Um, and you cannot generally, you cannot uh, market to the customer after the fact. Wow. So that customer is out of, out of bounds to you. So a customer books through Viator and they take your tour. They, all they do is take the tour with you. They, they, you know, you can't ask them to write a review for you. You, you can't technically, you can't market to them afterwards. You can't mm -hmm. send them emails, nothing. Like if they write a review, they're writing a review on Viator. Mm -hmm. Viator owns that review. So you lose out on all of those, um, all of those customer service elements that you get when it's a, when it's a direct booking. Not only that, not only do you not own the customer and it takes a while to get your money, it costs you up to 30% yeah. of the, of the revenue, right? So you're, so you're paying, you know, the, there's a cost there. There's a marketing cost that comes with selling through a distribution channel. So, um, yeah, direct is always preferred because that's, that's going to be your cheapest channel and it's mm -hmm. going to be the one where you have the greatest control over your, over your customer Great, and, the, and the best relationship with your customer, which is yeah. really, really the most important thing. I don't want to say control over your customer because you really have no control over the customer. <laughs> it's, really yeah. about the, it's 
really about the relationship with the customer. You have the direct relationship with the customer. Yeah, that's something I never realized. You know, I, um, from our side, you know, I know that the OTAs, they, they take a big chunk of, of basically your profit, but I never thought about, you know, they control the lifetime value of that customer that, you know, that's out of your mm -hmm. hands. So they, um, they could send them to a different tour next time they come back to their, um, that destination. Let's say there's somebody in the tour in Hawaii, you know, maybe they, they want to go on a zip line and then they come back with a group of friends. They go back to Viator. They might find a different zip line. Whereas if that, the first company they went with, they could keep that, that relationship going. Yeah. I never thought about that. That's, that's yeah. really powerful. Yeah. But that's what makes the OTAs stickier as well is that they're, they're not just, they're just, they're not just a one trick pony, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for a supplier, you've got, you've got very specific in the, the tours that you offer. Um, and so you can only really offer that same tour, but for, you know, buy tour or Expedia or get your guide, you've got thousands of tours. So they're, sure. they, they don't care who they sell as long as they sell something. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not, you know, so I mean, supplier A, eh, who cares? If they, you know, if the if, if the customer wants to take supplier B, or they want to recommend supplier B because supplier B is going to give them more commission, mm -hmm. um, then they'll go with supplier B, right? I mean, that's they're they're a retailer. They've uh, that's that's their that's their business. So they're interested in just selling. They don't really care what they sell uh, as long as they're selling something. So that you have to keep that in mind as a supplier. Your best interests your best interests are best served by selling direct to the customer. Sure. So let's take some time here and walk through some steps. You know, how can a tour, you know, increase the amount of direct sales that they're getting? So uh, mm -hmm. you and I talked a little bit about it. So what are some of the steps that somebody can take? Okay. Well, step number one, get a website, <laughs> <laughs> get a website and please don't use Wix. <laughs> um, you know, get a, seriously, get, get, put a little budget behind it. You know, mm -hmm. I know it's, uh, um, you don't have to put a ton of budget behind it. Uh, you know, use WordPress, for example, as a fantastic mm -hmm. platform. There are so many tools, so many plugins that you can use for WordPress. Um, it's free. Pretty much every host in the world supports WordPress. There are some that are kind of specialized for WordPress. Um, I would say, I, I would say go with WordPress, mm -hmm. pay for a, you know, pay a few bucks for a good theme. Um, they're not expensive. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you need help with that, there are lots of developers out there that, that kind of specialize in building small business websites for, uh, um, you know, for not a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm. Take a look at Fiverr, for example. I mean, you can get a, you can get someone to help you out with, with uh, setting up a, a website on Fiverr for, for not a lot of budget. So. And you can set up something that looks really nice. Um, keep it simple. You don't have to build something really fancy. Um, it's just, it's gotta be, it's gotta be um, easy to use from the mm -hmm. consumer standpoint. Um, and it's gotta be mobile friendly, like think mobile first, right? When these mm -hmm. customers are in, like these customers are in destination, they're not on their laptop. People don't bring their laptops on vacation. What do they bring on their vacation? They bring their phone on vacation, right? What are they doing? They're going on their phones and they're looking, they're going to Google and they're doing a search for things that are close by. And if your site is well optimized for, for, uh, for mobile, Google's going to index it well. Um, and then you're going to show up in search. Customers are going to click it. And even if you don't have online booking, if you have a way for them to contact you, um, then that's kind of step one, mm -hmm. right? Is, is have a way for them to find you online and number two, contact you. Um, and, and I would say get an online booking system that is mobile friendly because mm -hmm. um, it'll just save you so much headache. Because when are people looking for stuff online? They're looking for stuff online when you're busy trying to do your business or when you're sleeping. So do you really want to be responding <laughs> to phone calls at, mm -hmm. you know, after dinner or or dealing with emails in the middle of the night? Probably not. I mean, if you've got an online booking system that, that can handle that for you, then it's it's basically a 24 seven sales machine. Let it do its thing. Mm -hmm. Let customers book online. And and then, you know, you show up for to, to run your tours the next day and you've got, hey, a bunch of new customers. That's great. And that's what you want to go for, right? That's, that's really the first step is making sure you've got that mobile friendly website and keep it simple and don't use Wix. Squarespace, meh, it's, you know, uh, 
I would, I would really, really recommend just going with a good WordPress, you know, um, theme, mobile theme that, uh, or responsive theme and, uh, and pay for a little bit of help with it. You don't have to spend a lot. Uh, you know, I know, um, a lot of these businesses are, are a bit, um, tech phobic or, mm-hmm. you know, they, they're, they're very, very budget conscious. And I understand that. Uh, and I, I certainly appreciate that, but it's your brand, it's your brand and it's your company image online. And people will look at that and they will determine how um, their, their comfort level with you and their confidence with your business based on how you present yourself online. Um, and that's critical. So, you know, spend, spend a little bit of budget and do it right. Um, don't have to spend a ton, but do it right and do it simple mm-hmm. and make sure it works. Yeah, that's really powerful. And just a, another note on, on basically, you know, you're talking about your brand and the importance of that. Uh, we had a previous podcast uh, with Matt Newton. If you go to our website, we have it up there. Um, but he had mentioned something that I had never considered that if you have a, I don't know how to use any other word than janky. If you have a janky looking website, <laughs> people associate that as your brand. They're going to assume you have mm-hmm. you know, janky equipment that you have. Um, you know, it's not going to be very friendly. But if you take a little bit of time and a little bit of effort and, um, you know, Stephen, I know that you're a bit of a techie guy and, you know, you know development fairly well and I'm the same for there are websites out there for 30 US dollars you can get a beautiful a beautiful WordPress theme that you know basically works out of the box and and can work fairly well mm-hmm. yeah yep yeah, absolutely absolutely so yeah just do your research get a get a little bit of help you know I'm sure someone in your family <laughs> you know it, it knows tech <laughs> like get some help right? Yeah. Just ask. Yeah. Ask. Um, and you know, don't be afraid to ask other people that are in your community, Mm -hmm. um, that are in the tour and activity space. Um, and and, you know, see what they're using, ask them, uh, you know, start to build relationships. This, Mm -hmm. this, This space in particular is really small business focused. And the more that businesses can work together in, in these environments, um, the, the stronger the, the business becomes. Cause I mean, you know, people are not always going to want to do your specific offering. They may want to do something different. And if you can, if you can, um, work with other local suppliers to offer them, um, options and, and refer them off to your, to your, um, you know, other, to your trusted partners in the, in the destination, they will do the same for you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's how everybody, you know, that's how everybody grows their business. Um, and, you know, reach out and find out, see what people are doing. There's a fantastic website. I don't know if you're aware of it, um, um, Dustin, but, it, but if you aren't, you might want to take a look at it. It's Tourism Tribe out of Australia, Fabian Whistle and um, uh, Liz Ward, who used to work with the Australian Tourism Data Warehouse. I've known them for years, fantastic people. Mm-hmm. Um, they put together a community called Tourism Tribe, and it's basically a forum, um, and there's there's classes and all kinds of things that you can do as mm-hmm. well. Um, um, but th- there's an, a kind of an open forum where, where operators and, and small um, accommodations providers and stuff can, can ask questions and the community just kind of chimes in and helps them. So there was one recently about gift vouchers that I kind of jumped in on and, mm-hmm. and answered a question about that. But th- those are the kinds of communities, look for them online, those kinds of communities where you, where, you know, ask for help, ask for guidance, um, use resources that are out there. I mean, if you want to, if you want to shoot me a, a message on LinkedIn, feel free. I mean, I'm always happy to, to answer questions and, and reach out and, and give my two cents. So there, there's lots of people out there like us that, that are, are, you know, passionate about this space and really want to see small business succeed. So use us. That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, let's say somebody has, you know, they built their website, maybe they have a website already, you know, what do they do? What do they do next in this process to try to get more direct bookings? So my recommendation would be look at um, working with uh, either work with local partners, if you can, Mm -hmm. knowing that that offline is a big part of the business. Um, So look at what you're doing now in terms of your your offline marketing. Everybody does brochures when they're in market, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in a destination, there's brochures at the 
tourism offices as brochures at the hotels. Once you have that website, make sure your website address is on your brochure because the first thing a customer is going to do when they pick up that brochure is they're going to look at your, they're going to look at whether or not you have a website. Mm -hmm. And if you do, they're going to go to your website first, mm -hmm. right? Before they mm -hmm. pick up the phone and call you, they're going to go to your website first. And so they can see what tours you offer, what your pricing's like, et cetera, et cetera. So all the print collateral that you do, make sure that your website is on that print collateral. Um, if you have print collateral that you that you now print, if you're using a, um, a uh, an online booking tool of some kind, um, make sure that your brochure has some kind of tracking on it, some kind mm -hmm. of code that you can um, that incentivizes the the consumer to go to your website and make a booking and use that code. So it could be something that is you know book. Book with us and save five dollars when you use this code, right? Promo mm. 2018 or whatever. I mean, you print new brochures every year, so change it up if you can, because uh, then you can track it on an annual basis as well. Mm. And use that so that when customers come through, you know they're coming from the brochure. Now you've got a way to track how the uh, how the brochure is working out for you. So use, take a look at your existing marketing collateral and how you can drive people that are already consuming that collateral, you can convert them from just looking at that collateral into actually transacting based on that collateral, whether that's the brochure, whether that's, um, you know, relationships with existing uh, concierges at hotels, or whether it's local sales partners or activity desks, um, all of those types of things. Look at ways where you can make it simpler for those partners to now actually generate revenue for you rather than just refer business to you. Because uh -huh. once they start generating now, you can also do things like, um, although those are technically indirect sales, if they're doing the, if they're, um, if they're selling for you, um, mind you, you're, you're getting the money. Generally the consumers mm -hmm. aren't, aren't actually collecting money. You can pay them some kind of commission and incentivize them to actually, um, yeah you know, drive business to you. Um, so there's more opportunity to, to, to be more effective with that kind of sales. Um, the other thing I would say is look at, look at advertising, look at Google ads online, um, look at using keywords that, um, you know, don't, don't use really broad based keywords, use keywords that are really specific to the type of tour that you offer. So if you're a, you know, if you're a horseback, um, tour through the mountains in you know in on the big island of hawaii use those keywords use very mm -hmm. specific keywords you know family uh if you're kind of family oriented then then use you know family uh horseback riding big island hawaii adventure whatever like keywords that are really specific to your tour so when people go in and start searching for specific things if they're looking for family and they and they you know want horses then you're going to show up really well, right? You're not just going to show up in a generic search. Mind you, the generic searches are also going to be really, really expensive. So when mm -hmm. you look at doing specific searches and you're using specific keywords, the, the cost of your, of your ads tend to go down as well because you're, um, you're being more specific. And, and you know that, I mean, that's your, that's your bread and butter, Dustin. So I mean, you, <laughs> yep. can, you can probably talk to that more than, more than I can, but, but uh, yeah, you know, using, using tools like um like google ads to be really effective uh -huh. i mean when you think about think about the cost right so here's a scenario you pay a dollar a click that's not an unreasonable uh -huh. um, price to pay for a click on a, yeah. on a you know pretty specific keyword you pay a dollar per click you get a hundred clicks that's a hundred dollars let's say you can convert so that's a hundred people that have clicked on that ad and have gone to your website uh -huh. right let's say you convert 10% of them, just 10%, right? So that's 10 people that have actually booked something with you as a result of that. If your tour is $100, which is kind of the average mm -hmm. per person, right? So that's $100 per person. Average number of people that get booked on a tour is two. So that's $200, a $200 sale per person. 200 times 10, you've now made $2,000 mm -hmm. and you've spent a hundred dollars in Google ads. Your cost is 5%. So you've paid the equivalent of 5% uh, um, to, to generate $2,000 worth of bookings. Now, if mm -hmm. you were to generate $2,000 worth of bookings through an OTA, you're going to be spending, what is that? 
six hundred bucks. Oh yeah. In commission mm -hmm. versus a hundred dollars. So think about that, right? I mean, the, if you can, and then look at doubling your conversion rate. If your conversion rate is only ten percent, you're getting a hundred people to look at your website that are mm -hmm. interested in booking, and only ten of them book. Look at ways that you can increase that conversion rate from from ten percent to to twenty percent. Oh yeah. Now you've just reduced the cost of that ad down to two and a half percent. I mean, that's really good, especially if you've priced your your tours with a with a healthy uh, retail margin. That's that's a really good way to make um, direct sales, um, and it's and it's cost effective, right? So that's that's the way that you want to look at it. Is is you know. Um, really look at the numbers and, mm -hmm. and know, you know, how much you're, how much you can generate and how much you are actually generating from the ads that you're, that you're making. And if you track that stuff, you'll find that your cost per sale when you're using a, when you're using Google ads is going to be much more effective than your cost per sale. If you're doing it through, uh, through, you know, retail OTA or something. Yeah. And or heaven forbid a group on <laughs> yeah, Groupon seems to be the bane. I won't get into that though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's a whole that's a offline topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a whole other topic. Yeah, um, but yeah, you know what we've seen from our our experience too is is you know AdWords and and, and basically areas like that in, in the paid media realm, um, you know, have an ability. It seems like such an upfront cost, but they have the ability to be so much less than you know using some of these online OTAs, just like you had mentioned. Um, and just to you know, bring that back in, not only are you paying less, but once they, they book directly with you, you can then um, you know, build a better relationship with them, you know, reach out to them you know, later through email or, or other sort of uh, advertising methods and, and you know, increase the value of that one sale. And, and maybe that one customer gave you the $100 that one time, but maybe two years down the line, you know, they come back, maybe another two years, they come back and that $100 then turns into you know, maybe a thousand dollars just over the lifetime because of that initial investment. Mm -hmm. So just to recap a little bit, so build a website, basically, you know, promote the website through, you had mentioned brochures are really powerful and still really popular. Um, partnerships, uh, you know, through either like a um, concierge, um, other, would you recommend, you know, building partnerships with other tours? You know, let's say somebody's reaching out, they're just getting started building a website. Is that a time to maybe um, you know, try to, to form a partnership as well? Um, yeah, I mean, look at look at who else is in your community. Um, see if there are uh, other tours that are um, compatible or um, would work well with your tour, um, and see if there are ways that that you can cross promote each other. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's no reason why you know there's no reason why you can't cross cross promote within uh, within a destination that's a great way to uh, to build partnerships you know well i'll refer business to you if you refer business to me and, and just make sure you can track it that's the key is is make mm -hmm. sure that you can track it. don't just put a link on there and be like yeah you know whatever happens happens no track it i mean you these are marketing initiatives make sure you track them mm -hmm. you know and, and it's not hard put a campaign id on it track it through track it through uh, google analytics because you should make sure you have Google Analytics on your site. Okay, yeah. so let's just go back one step. After you build your website, <laughs> yeah, get yourself a Google Analytics account and make sure that you have Google Analytics on your website. Then you can do all the other tracking. Mm -hmm. So yeah, make sure you have that. Step number two, I forgot step number two. Step number so two, make sure that's in there. add Google Analytics. <laughs> Add Google <laughs> Analytics. Yeah, that's one of the, it's one of the the things I see all the time is that people have great websites. They have no idea how many people are going to their website. They have no idea oh, how many no. people are converting, where they're leaving, what pages they're they're dropping off on. All that stuff they it, it can tell you in uh, in Google An Analytics. I mean, we have that within Resco. We actually have a uh, we use the Google Analytics API within the platform, mm -hmm. so you get all that information from within the platform but only for the pages that are actually managed by, by uh, the, the Resco platform. Yeah. We can't track that beyond. Um, so you need to have that on your own website. You need to have Google Analytics on your own website as well. So let's just talk about the tracking a little bit because that is something yeah. that um, everyone kind of brushes over because it does get a little bit technical and it doesn't have to be really technical. Uh, you can literally just, you know, take notes, you know, weekly through Google Analytics and, and kind of look at them. Mm -hmm. Let's take it a little bit. Let's say someone starts tracking some, some metrics, whether it's they're booking from partnerships or they're booking from a website or they're booking from an OTA. 
Why is that so important? Because uh, you want to know where your money's coming from. I mean, if you, if you have no idea where your money is coming from, where your bookings are coming from, then you don't know where to, to focus your attention and your marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at, if, if you have no idea where the bookings are coming from, um, it's going to be very easy for you as a supplier to, um, to misunderstand how impactful certain channels are, right? And you may start to then focus on channels where you shouldn't be focusing on. Um, you know, you may find that if you're not paying attention, you may find that OTA sales are actually cannibalizing your direct business and you don't want that. You want, you want OTA sales to be filling seats for you that you can't fill directly. Um, that's, that's really the, 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 um, the benefit that they potentially bring. Um, you don't want to be selling a seat, uh, to someone that you can sell for, for two and a half percent. Uh, you don't want to sell that seat for 30% because mm -hmm. there's, that's a lot of margin that could be all of your margin gone. Um, so you can only do that if you pay attention to where your bookings are coming from um, and you track them. Um, and that's really critical. So that's why you have to track because otherwise you have no way to plan or to make good business decisions. So you basically, so you've tracked everything, you know where everything is coming from, you know, all your bookings are coming from, what the revenue looks like from each of those bookings. Uh, if you're really mm -hmm. smart, you also, you know, pay, you're tracking how much you're paying out to each of those systems and then yeah. you know, the making decisions. So it sounds like you're saying once you have all these uh, numbers laid down, you can look at them and say, well, last year I spent X number of dollars promoting at, you know, um, let's say you did a magazine ad in destination and you spent $500 mm -hmm. and you look, you're like, Oh, well I only got one booking out of that. And that booking was worth $200. So you're out, out $300 yeah. just to make it simple. But then you look over at, at Google AdWords and maybe you spent, you know, instead of $500, you spent a thousand dollars, but you got 10 bookings worth $2,000. So, you know, the next year when you're looking at your numbers, you say, well, let me take that five that $500 away from the magazine and put it into the, the AdWords side and then just scale from there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what you want to be able to do is to, is to look at the channels that are not performing and then move that budget from the channels that are not performing to the channels that are performing mm -hmm. um, so that you're maximizing the revenue from the channels that are actually making you money. So if it is Google ads, great, spend more money on Google ads. Mm -hmm. Clearly you're getting a better return on your investment when you invest in Google ads and you are, you know, advertising that local newspaper. Now there may be, you know, that said, there may be other reasons why you advertise in that local newspaper. It may be, you know, it may be uh, to support a charity or maybe just brand, a brand building exercise or whatever the case may be. And that's fine too, mm -hmm. but make sure that you track that. Like if, if that's the reason why you do it, make sure you understand it, it clearly that that's the business decision about why you did it. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it for revenue purposes, make sure you can track it. And that means putting some kind of code on it so that you can track the bookings back um, and using a different code for each of those campaigns, um, different promotional code for each of those campaigns. So you can track that right through to the booking process. So at the end of the year, you can say, show me all the bookings that we, with this code that only exists on my brochure mm -hmm. so that I know how many bookings I generated from my brochure. And at the end of the day, you may, you know, you may find that maybe it's just not worth it to print those brochures at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But you can't make that decision if you have no data. And that's really the, the critical piece. I mean, you may find those brochures are hugely valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great too. But again, you just won't know unless you actually see some data and, and you can, at the end of the year, you can go, wow, those brochures were great. I can't <laughs> believe I made that much money on brochure, you know, by printing a brochure. And if that's the case, I'm sure the brochure, you know, printers and the folks that stack those, those, I mean, you can, you know, you can tell them and I'm sure they'll be happy to, to take that data and, and use it for their promotional purposes <laughs> too. Cause they probably don't have a lot of that data either. Sure. Sure. And uh, one of the things too, that's really important about tracking that a lot of people don't really discuss is many of um, the suppliers that I talk to, they have partners, whether it's a husband and wife team or um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's the owner of the company, but they've got a, a head uh, guide or a lead that they are often working with. And a lot of times there's going to be differing of opinions, especially when it comes to marketing. Everyone likes to, to lend their opinion to marketing. 
And I have a favorite phrase that says, don't bring an opinion to a data fight. And when you have the numbers and somebody says, you know, we need to do more of X or we need to do more of Y, the, the argument really isn't, you know, yes or no, or I think this is best or I think this is best. You know, you can actually track the numbers and determine what is, what is best overall. And, and that ends the fight right there. Yeah. Yeah. I have another saying about opinions. They're like farts. Everybody has them and they all stink. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like that too. I like that too. So yeah, data is critical. You can't, you can't argue with data. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. To, it's hard to argue with, with, uh, with data. So yeah, I'm a big believer in that too. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So you kind of touched on uh, a couple times through this process. And I know that when we had prepped before, you didn't want to talk too much about ResGo, but I want to spend a little bit of time and talk about, you know, how does ResGo help tours? Um, and I'd like for you to start right with the tracking. You know, what can you do with the tracking? Um, that's a little bit mm-hmm. different than some of the other people that are out there. You and I have had conversations about it, but I'd like for you to share because to me, that's, that's, that's really important. I wish every tour could track um, as much as you guys track. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, as you could probably tell, data and tracking is, are, are, you know, important to me. They're, they're <laughs> yeah. clearly things that I'm passionate about. Um, so, yeah, so data and tracking have always been integral to the system. Even from very, very early on, we, we uh, added support in for, um, for analytics codes very early on. So you could add any type of analytics code into the system, whether you were using Google Analytics or HitLinks or whatever tools you, were, you wanted to use. Um, uh, we added conversion tracking. So you can add conversion tracking codes as well as standard analytic code. So mm-hmm. you could um, do things like track uh, conversions on uh, Google Ads or Yahoo or Bing Ads um, oh. in the Google Analytics code. We also added support for Google e-commerce. Um, tracking so you can add your Google uh, Google account code in and then Resgo actually generates the, the JavaScript that uh, the tracks the the, uh, the value and the location and all those all those extra fields that are required to do the the, uh, the Google uh, conversion mm-hmm. to do the conversion for e-commerce um, so that's all built in um, that's for your own third-party tracking now within Resgo itself we also do analytics uh, we have the built-in analytics uh, that uses uh, Google Analytics to track things like um, what are your what are your uh, what tours are people looking at? Where are your customers coming from? Um, what pages are they looking at? Like all the kind of standard mm-hmm. stuff, but we've simplified a lot of it so that it's easy for a for a non-technical user to be able to get a really good sense that, of you know what what their website is doing, what their booking engine is doing primarily. That, those analytics are for the booking engine. The regular analytics are for a combination of tracking from the website mm-hmm. into the booking engine and then converting, right? So we track that all the way through. Um, so that's on the analytics side and, and conversion tracking side. Now within the system, we also have the concept of a referral ID, uh, which we've had very early on. And the referral ID is basically any alphanumeric code that you can tack on to the URL to be able to track um, to track a referral all the way through to the booking process. So yeah. if you wanted to, you know, uh, use a campaign, almost like a campaign code in Google, um, Google Analytics. So you could actually use the same campaign code, um, write it to the, to the referral ID and then track that all the way through the booking, uh, right through to, uh, to the booking create process. Um, and then we also have promo codes, which can act the same way, but promo codes actually have an impact on the booking so they can change pricing or change availability or things like that. So act like a discount or make something available that normally wouldn't be available or things like that. So, so that kind of, that level of tracking is there as well, all the way through. And all of those things uh, get stored all the way down to the booking level. So when you run your reports, you can see based on, um, based on location, based on um, mm-hmm. where the booking was made, based on, um, you know, any number of criteria from a reporting standpoint, you know, what referral ID was used, how many times the referral ID was used, all those sorts of things. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, those are all critical, uh, critical bits that are, that are in the system. And, they, and we designed it to really work well with other tools. Um, cause we know, you know, I mean, the, the more sophisticated suppliers for, for, uh, 
For a supplier that's not as sophisticated, they can just use the tools that are in the system. For one that is a, that is a little bit more sophisticated, that's using advanced reporting and analytics and stuff, they can capture all of that outside of the system and use analytics to report back on all that stuff. So, but uh, yeah, that's, that's basically what we've done to, to, to keep track of all that stuff. And I think um, from what I understand, that's, that's um, more than most in terms of how tracking is done. We've, we've always been very cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. So it's been a big part of the DNA. Yeah, it is really important, um, especially for a company like us, you know, we're a marketing agency and, and we want to see mm -hmm. across the board, you know, how things are happening to, to garner those insights. So that way we can then, you know, make future business decisions like we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you touched earlier um, was making sure that your website was mobile friendly. I'm assuming that Resgo has got a mm -hmm. mobile friendly booking system. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a response, it's fully responsive. Um, mm -hmm. And that's both the both the front end, the front end website, and the back office. So the back office oh, wow. is actually fully responsive. Um, so we've tested it all the way down to you know an iPhone, uh, iPhone X or iPhone six or even down on iPhone five, it looks fine. Oh, wow. um, and so all the functions work on the back office, uh, right down to the full booking process. On the front end, fully responsive. So um, even if the even if the operators in that have a website, the system knows to switch to the mobile version um, to, oh, to use the, yeah. So you can, you, it is responsive, but mm -hmm. uh, if the, if for example, the operator has co-branded their website with a template that is not responsive, the system will automatically default to a different version of the booking engine. So it's, oh, wow. so it's still mobile friendly. So they can't, basically they can't mess it up mm -hmm. the, <laughs> I, unless, well, Technically, they could. I mean, it, you can mess up anything, really. But um, we, we've taken steps to kind of prevent that as much as possible. So, yeah, that's really great. That's really great. Um, so, what else is going on with Resco? We, we had talked a little bit about um, a review system. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, with the with the changes in in uh, kind of kind of the global privacy uh, um, world, um, the uh, it, we looked at uh, ways that we could um, enhance the uh, the review process for consumers and kind of uh, keep simplify that and and uh, really help the suppliers to generate more um, reviews for themselves uh, and um, increase their reputation um, and improve their reputation online by using reviews. Um, we do have a partnership with with uh, TripAdvisor Review Express. Um, where there there are issues now with GDPR that uh, that may uh, that we've seen have resulted in issues around that. Um, so as a result, we're, we've taken steps and, and created a, a new review platform within the within Resgo that uh, is really really simple for the for the um, customers to use. So basically, when they because we know the customers they're all verified reviews that's that's the key mm -hmm. thing with with the uh, review platform that's built in is that it's all verified reviews so we know these are real customers these aren't these aren't you know people that are just kind of disgruntled with the business or you know like what happened like what happened with yelp uh, you know people just kind of storm on mm -hmm. and and end up you know letting their their political views kind of drive whether or not it's a one star or five star review which is mm -hmm. really not what review platforms should be used for so what we've done is is uh, when the customer completes the tour, 48 hours after they complete the tour, they get an email or an SMS, depending on whether or not they've opt in for SMS, wow. um, with, a, with the link to write the review. They go and click it. It's all mobile friendly, so they can mm -hmm. do it right on their phone. They don't have to enter in their name. They don't have to choose the product. They don't have to do, you know, enter in the date that they traveled or mm -hmm. any of that stuff. Basically, it's three form fields. It's the star rating, um, the title, and the review text so they can wow. type it right on there that's it they submit it and it's done um, super super simple so we've simplified it down to three basic fields it should be really easy to 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 gather those reviews and then now we've got reviews that are um, product specific so um, the one of the issues with TripAdvisor is that they are company level reviews although they have said that they've rolled out um, product specific reviews we still haven't seen those so um, so most of the reviews are still company level, 
And so when you're looking at a, at a, at a tour, you're seeing the same reviews across all of the tours because mm-hmm. there's no product level reviews. So this is a way to, to, uh, to improve that. So give the consumer uh, more of an idea, kind of Amazon style reviews mm-hmm. that, uh, that give them a, a better indication of, of, of um, the quality of the, of the tour. And it's a feedback me- mechanism for the, for the supplier so they can improve their tour and, and get feedback from actual customers. And that's really the key is that these are actual customers that are, that are doing it. You can't be anonymous when you write the review <laughs> because the supplier is going to know who you are because, yeah. you know, it's tied to your booking. So, um, so no so competitors it's a very can hop clear... on and ruin your reviews. All your competitors. Exactly. No competitors. Are gonna, <laughs> yeah, it won't, you can't do it. So it's a, yeah, I mean, that's really the key is that it's kind of a, it's a lockdown, um, really designed to, to, to get that feedback from the, mm-hmm. from the customer um, in, in, as, in as an efficient way as possible. Um, so we're really excited to see that, that got rolled out. Um, and, uh, and our uh, payment uh, system that, we, that uh, I think we talked about a little bit as well is, uh, is um, uh, rolled out and that's very exciting too because that, that uh, really opens up the opportunity for a lot of that, you know, that 31% as well as the other 65% that don't have uh, websites to, um, to hop on and, and uh, use a platform. Um, and that's global. So really in, in markets where, uh, where payments are, um, are very difficult to, to get and to manage, we can support those, those, uh, those countries and those regions. So that's really, that's really key. We're, we're really excited about that. So. Yeah, that's really great. That's really great. So um, if somebody wants to find more about Resgo, of course, they can go to the website. Um, if they want to reach mm-hmm. out to you, is LinkedIn, you mentioned the best place to go. Is there any other way that people can reach out to you directly? Uh, LinkedIn's the best way. Uh, Twitter as well. Uh, okay. You can find me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Stephen Joyce. It's very easy. Um, and, uh, and actually on, on LinkedIn, it's uh, LinkedIn slash in slash Stephen Joyce. So it's, uh, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, or you can just Google me and I show up. I have to compete with the, with the minister of natural resources from, <laughs> from uh, New Zealand. Wow. That's okay. And this, and the CEO, well, the ex CEO of choice hotels, who is now the CEO of, of dine out, which is the, the parent company of the, of, uh, ABC restaurants. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Other than those two, you know, I'll show up in that list in that Google, uh, that initial Google search. So, uh, so I'm not hard to find online. Great. Great. Well, I hope some people reach out to you and, uh, I know that you're very willing to help and, um, just have a passion for that. So anybody that's listening, you know, feel free to reach out to Steven. He's happy to help. Um, so before we close up, I just want to recap really quick and let me know if I'm skipping anything. I'm mm-hmm. uh, kind of took some notes here, but basically what we're looking at is if you want more direct bookings, which are, they're more profitable, you've got a better lifetime, um, relationship with the customers. There's just a lot more options and control you have over that. If you want to get that kind of uh, customer, you know, build a website, make sure you have a website. Those numbers are shocking. Uh, in my mind, everyone has a website these days, but if you don't, you know, build a website, make it mobile friendly, use WordPress. Um, from there, promote people to your website uh, through several different methods you talked about, you know, rack cards, brochures, um, partnerships, and make sure you track it. Uh, that's the number one thing that I seem to, to mm. take away from you is make sure you're tracking everything. And, and as you were talking about reviews, reviews are actually just a method of tracking uh, your, mm-hmm. your, your progress. And so people don't think about it in those terms, but you know, think about how important reviews are to you. Uh, that's the level of tracking. Um, and then you know, a final point is use OTAs, not as your initial source, but to fill seats you can't book yourself. I feel like that's a really yeah. important one. Uh, did I miss anything? Yeah. In- incre- incremental revenue. That's what the OTAs are yeah. for is incremental revenue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You want them to fill those seats you can't fill. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, is there anything else? Oh, man, we've covered a lot. <laughs> we've covered a lot. I would say go out there, have fun, do what you do because people love doing tours and activities. It's the best part of the trip. Right. I mean, who the best really enjoys there. that flight and you know, how much time do they really spend in the hotel? I don't yeah. know. They want to go out there and they want to have fun. And you know, that's, that's what I love about this industry is that it's, it's about having fun. It's yeah. about making sure that the travelers are having fun. So go out there and do what you do. Cause it's the, it's the best part of travel. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, are you going to be at arrival this year? Speaking of which, 
I will. Yes, I'll be talking on a on a on pricing. Actually, is my is my topic. So I'm going to talk about some of the psychology of pricing. Um, you know, making sure that your pricing is is set up so that you're at the end of the day you're making money regardless of what channel it's going through. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about that because I get to bring in some. Uh, I'm going to bring in some psychology and and do some fun stuff with that. So I'm going to make pricing, which is generally not a really interesting <laughs> subject. I'm going to make it really fun. So yeah, make sure you you find me at. Uh, at uh, arrival uh, i'll be easy to spot i'll be wearing the bow tie perfect look for the bow tie at arrival if you're going to head out there uh steven thank you so much for joining us i really appreciate it um if anybody has any questions reach out to steven um if you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet please subscribe um go to outdooradventuremarketing.com slash tips for two operators to listen to any previous episodes we'll link some description uh link uh resgo in the descriptions as well as your linkedin um steven thank you so much i really appreciate it You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. See ya. Take care.